I am a boy. No matter what anyone says, I genetically have female parts. I am a boy because that's just who I am. It's been one of the harshest winters Maine has seen in years, but the unrelenting snowfall won't keep Mount Ararat High School from its swim meet against rival Winslow. 14-year-old freshman Leo Eichfeld is trying to blend in with his male teammates, some of whom knew him as Adele a few months earlier. My gender is nothing special. It's just the same as anyone else on my swim team. Like, and that's how I think of it. As a transgender boy, Eichfeld has had to make some accommodations, like wearing a swimsuit equipped with binders stitched into the top. What do the binders do? They just pull everything back and some are comfortable and some are just like, oh, I feel like I'm dying. Eichfeld says the physical pain is preferable to the discomfort he felt growing up with a female identity. When you look back at pictures of yourself when you were younger, how does it make you feel? It reminds me of when I identified as a girl and doing that kind of was awkward all the time. He just wasn't happy and I didn't know what was going on. Eichfeld's pain made his mother, Bridget, question herself. What did I do wrong? What, where did I go wrong? When ultimately there was nothing that anybody did wrong, it was just who he was. Why are you emotional? Because he's so cool. And there's so many kids who get hurt just for being who they are. So that's a second faster. Yeah. In November, with the support of his parents, Eichfeld summoned the courage to make his transition to a male identity public and use sports as his vehicle to do so. I knew if I wanted to comfortably play on a team, I would have to come out to everyone. And that was a little nerve wracking. It's putting myself out there and saying, please accept me. In March, 2013, the Maine Principals Association approved a policy allowing transgender high school athletes to play on teams consistent with their gender identity. Eichfeld and his mother met with the MPA board, and after approving his candidacy, Eichfeld joined the boys' swim team. What do you think it takes for a 14-year-old to come out as transgender his freshman year of high school and compete on a boys' team? A lot of guts. <laughs> Courage, yeah. yeah. It's been a great learning experience for everybody on the team. Tracy Dobiak coaches the Mount Ararat boys and girls swim teams. I think for Leo, just really a good confidence builder, not only as a swimmer, but as a person. You know, I, th I think he feels respected. Ms. Dobiak explained it to me. She, um, she just said that uh, Leo is going to be swimming on the boys swim team and that um, he was biologically a girl. And so that, that was really it. You didn't ask any questions at all about it? No. Why not? It's just kind, kind of, of accepted like, it. Kind of, it's his choice. Since I was able to go through being on the team as being transgender, I think I can go through a lot more, um, more confidently than if I hadn't. Come on. 15-year-old Shay Sullivan from Montana can't have that experience. Born Seamus, a biological male, Sullivan says she began dressing as a girl when she was eight. Why did you love that outfit? Because it was like the most feminine thing that I had in my wardrobe. When she was in sixth grade, Sullivan began to publicly identify as female, but it came at a price. There was lots of bullying. Um, I got lots of threats. I would get things like, um, you know, I'm gonna beat you up. The bullying got to a point where I got to a really dark place. 
and it was a way out. What did you do? Well, I was cutting myself. What was your intent? To feel better. I think it was grieving the loss of that son, but um, realizing that I still have my child. She's just, she's, she's a female. Like, he has? Oh yeah. Shelly Sullivan is Shay's mother. I remember Shay saying one time, she came into the bedroom and she looked at me and she said, Mom, if this is too difficult for the family, I don't want to do it. And I said, we're going to honor and respect you, no matter what that entails. Sullivan transferred to a new middle school with her new female identity. She began taking hormones, joined the girls' basketball and track teams, and changed in the locker room stalls to keep her male anatomy a secret from her teammates. I was able to play on a sports team, and I saw a way out in a more positive sense. I've never liked to lie to anybody, but um, I'm glad that I did it just for the greater good of my well-being. And I was a really, I was really afraid that something was going to happen to me. You enter high school, right? And now you want to play sports again? What happens? They tell me I can't. Montana is one of 17 states that doesn't have a policy in place to accommodate transgender high school student athletes. A proposal was scheduled to go up for vote in January, but the Montana Family Foundation found out. The role of the foundation is to um, affect public policy in a positive way for families from a Judeo-Christian value in uh, the public arena. Jeff Lazlafi is the Montana Family Foundation's president and CEO. We think that, that um, boys and girls should celebrate who they are, not try to cover up who they are and pretend that there's no difference. The foundation mobilized its base and ignited a statewide debate. The Montana High School Association is preparing to vote on a policy for transgender athletes. And on January 19th, the Montana High School Association recognized the policy didn't have the necessary support. The executive board withdraws this proposal. It's disappointing. To me, it's our, our simple human rights. Like, I, I, sh I should not have to try to fight my way to be able to play on a on a certain kind of team just because I'm a little different. Opponents point out biological males have a physical advantage over females, making a transgender male's inclusion on a women's team unfair. What effect does you biologically being a boy have on your ability as an athlete? It doesn't have an effect. How do you know? I've had, I've been on hormone blockers for a couple of years now and I've, I've been taking estrogen for almost two years now. I have less testosterone in my system than, than a normal girl does. Typically boys with testosterone can be seen as being better athletes. Why should that not be a factor? Well, I mean, there's always going to be somebody that's bigger and stronger than you. So you can sit around and say, oh, that's not fair because that person's bigger and stronger than me. Just push yourself. He's at a disadvantage physically when you're, you know, built like that. He's not built like the boys are. They're bigger, they're stronger. And he knew that going into it. Opponents of an inclusive transgender policy say there are other issues to consider. Should people be placed in a position where they have to be in a locker room with somebody of the opposite sex just so that they can play sports? These are questions we have to answer before we go any further down the road with this policy. I changed in the stall, you know, and many other girls did too. That's why I hate that argument because I can say for myself as a trans woman that I'm already um, pretty self-conscious as it is. So I'm not willing to change in front of anybody that isn't a direct family member. <laughs> Eichfeld says he also prefers to change in private and does so no matter which locker room accommodation is provided for him. Being open-minded, he says, is the first step towards understanding and inclusion.
if you're going to do all this work to prohibit these trans people from playing on the team that they feel comfortable on, why not put all this time and effort and money into it and making everyone comfortable and educating these people who are uncomfortable rather than taking away these trans kids' rights. The story of proven facts and Mayweather's response is reported by John Barr. I'm young, I'm fly, I'm flashy, I'm rich. Damn, life is good. Money, paper, guava, moolah, confetti. He is rich, famous, and more than willing to flaunt it. Already the highest paid athlete in the world, Floyd Mayweather is about to hit the mother load. Estimates of his payday for the Manny Pacquiao bout have reached $180 million. Mayweather Pacquiao, the biggest fight in boxing history. Thank you. But there's a darker side to Mayweather's personal narrative, obscured by his flamboyant lifestyle, a history of violence against women. I think that Floyd, by and large, has gotten a free ride from the media. Thomas Hauser is a boxing writer and historian. I have a lot of respect for the way he practices his craft. But in terms of the way he treats women in particular, he's not a role model. According to police and court documents obtained by Outside the Lines, Mayweather has been convicted five times for incidents dating back more than 14 years. February 2001, during an argument with Melissa Brim, the mother of his oldest daughter, Mayweather punched Melissa three times in the face, leaving fresh bruises. July 2001, Mayweather struck Brim in the neck while the two were shopping with their daughter. August 2003, Mayweather assaulted two women who were friends of his then girlfriend, Josie Harris, hitting and punching the women with a closed fist. Years later, Mayweather's conviction was vacated and dismissed. December 2003, Mayweather hit Harris, the mother of his other three children, in her face. A police report noted she had several visible bruises about her head. Mayweather was eventually found not guilty after Harris changed her story. But in September 2010, yet another incident with Harris. And this time, Mayweather would land in jail. Hey, man, what happened with Josie yesterday? <laughs> According to a police report, Mayweather grabbed Harris by her hair and began striking her in the back of her head with a closed fist several times, and then threatened to kill her. As two of her three children looked on, Harris wrote later in a statement, he continued to beat me in front of them, threatening to beat them the same way. Harris, as you can see in this video obtained by TMZ, was wheeled away on a stretcher. But when asked by ESPN about the incident, Mayweather denied assaulting her. If I really did what they say I did, as far as uh, beating a woman and stomping a woman, I'm Floyd Mayweather. They would have brought pictures out instantly. Still no pictures, no nothing. Floyd Mayweather Jr., 10F, 174-53X. In June 2012, Mayweather began serving his 90-day jail sentence, but he was out in two months, and the judge in the case agreed to delay Mayweather's sentence long enough to let him fight Miguel Cotto in May of that same year. If Ray Rice had been criminally convicted and was going to prison for 90 days, and the judge said, well, we'll defer your jail time until after you play in the Super Bowl, and the NFL said, yeah, that's great, let's let Ray play in the Super Bowl, I think the reaction would have been much more heated than you see now. The infamous video of Ray Rice assaulting his then fiance and the NFL's mishandling of the incident led to changes in the league's domestic violence policy. I got it wrong in the handling of the Ray Rice matter. Rice was eventually suspended indefinitely, but has since been reinstated. Mayweather, despite multiple convictions, has never faced any suspension by boxing officials. To suggest that somehow that we should have second guess that punishment. I don't think that that's the role that the Nevada State Athletic Commission should be in. Pat Lundvall serves on the five-member Nevada State Athletic Commission. 
It was Lundvall and her fellow commissioners who voted unanimously to issue Mayweather a boxing license before he served his sentence. Do I think that domestic violence is a very serious issue? Absolutely. Mr. Mayweather was punished by the criminal justice system. He served his punishment. He paid his debt to society. But the commission has, in the past, suspended fighters for far less. And its own guidelines say it can suspend the license of any fighter who has violated the laws of Nevada except for minor traffic violations. You can suspend licenses for somebody who's arrested for anything north of a traffic violation. And you didn't do anything when a guy assaulted the mother of his children in front of his kids. I disagree with your characterization strongly. The criminal justice system had decided what this man's punishment was. A judge had made that decision, and we paid respect to that decision. The optics, mm -hmm. it just doesn't look good, does it? Well, the optics are your business. The optics are not my business. I don't have any confidence that the Boxing Commission will be the court of last resort or do justice for victims. Attorney Gloria Allred represents Mayweather's former fiance, Chantel Jackson, who alleges Mayweather also abused her. During an argument in 2012, Jackson alleges Mayweather choked her. Months later, after she threatened to leave him, Jackson claims Mayweather bent her arm, restrained her, and pointed a gun at her foot, asking, which toe do you want me to shoot? There was a point in my relationship with Floyd that I thought we would be together forever. He may have a boxing license. He does not have a license to hurt women. He doesn't get a pass. He doesn't get an exception because he's Floyd Mayweather Jr. He is being presented again and again as a role model. Somewhere in the United States tonight, a young man who thinks that Floyd Mayweather is a role model is going to beat up a woman. Over the years, Mayweather has been largely celebrated by the media, including this network. Mr. Mayweather, to your right, sir. At a recent event to promote the fight, we learned what happens when members of Mayweather's entourage, including his father, are asked about the boxer's troubled past. He has actual convictions and nothing's ever happened to him with respect to any kind of sanction by the governing bodies of boxing. Look at man, are you a police? No, I'm, hey. not, I'm not the police. I'm just you asking. Man, the police, man. Don't, don't tell me nothing about no, what Floyd doing with his beating his women and all. I, I want to hear all that. It's boxing, man. You want to talk about boxing? I Do you want to talk about boxing? Do you or don't you? I just Minutes later, we approached Mayweather with similar questions. In your case, there's been actual convictions and no governing body has ever suspended you or sanctioned you. What message do you think that sends victims of domestic violence? I just say I want everybody to tune in May 2nd. Mayweather versus Pacquiao, this is a fight that you can't miss. You have no desire to answer that question? I'm, bl I'm blessed to be where I'm at. You know, I have four beautiful children and I'm truly, truly blessed to be where I'm at today. And uh, with hard work and dedication, you can be anywhere in life. Well, look, unquestionably, you've worked hard to get to where you are, but there are a lot of people who wonder why you should be allowed to continue to box in the highest profile events when you've got the, the track record that you have, when in other sports, there have been serious repercussions for some of these athletes. Well, everybody's, you know, when it's all said and done, only God, God can judge you, but I don't want people to miss this fight. This is an unbelievable matchup. Mayweather Pacquiao. May 2nd, be there. With that, Mayweather was gone, declining to answer further questions. Just days ago, the Nevada State Athletic Commission had to decide once again whether to issue Mayweather a boxing license in time for his upcoming bout against Pacquiao. Call for the approval of Mr. Mayweather's license. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. Motion passes unanimously. And once again, the vote was unanimous. The bottom line, when Mayweather steps in the ring, Vegas cashes in. It's one of the reasons that the Las Vegas establishment has been so kind to Floyd, where his run-ins with the law have been concerned. We know how much money is brought in to the state of Nevada from boxing. It's huge. And does money 
matter more than violence against women? I think to many people it does. John Barr reporting. On South Carolina Saturdays every fall, more than 80,000 loyal and passionate Clemson Tigers football fans pack the stadium they affectionately call Death Valley. Deion King turns it up at the 30, King off to the race and then into the end zone, touchdown! But this past spring, Death Valley was quiet and empty. When Clemson Public Relations Director Ken Scar, an avid photographer, found a stuffed animal tiger at the highest point in the stadium. He took a snapshot and started a phenomenon. Thousands of people got onto our social media platforms and voted to name this thing Lachlan. We were all wondering, well, Lachlan? Uh, and it turns out Lachlan has a lot to do with Clemson and the Clemson family. In November 2012, avid Clemson fans Jason and Mary Tannery had identical twin boys, Calhoun and Lachlan, and immediately began passing that passion on to the next generation, especially Lachlan. From the time that he knew anything, we always played Tiger Brag, and they would do Briar and Go Tigers, and they would do the best they could to do the Tiger Chant. Shortly after the boys turned one, the family noticed Lachlan was getting sick more frequently than Calhoun, with multiple ear infections. They took Lachlan to the doctor. We found out when he was 19 months that uh, he had JMML, um, which is a very rare form of leukemia. It actually only affects approximately 25 children in the United States every year, so it's about one in a million. It rocked our world. Things don't happen to children typically, so it was devastating. The tanneries soon learned that Lachlan's only hope was a bone marrow transplant that promised less than a 50% chance of survival. His approach to treatment taught the tanneries true emotional strength and that every day is a gift. He was just the most calm, happy child you would ever see in a hospital. After his transplant, he had maybe 12 syringes he'd have to take by mouth orally. He would take them and just do them himself and just smile the whole time. He, he was a trooper, he really was. The Tanneries instantly began advocating for Be The Match, a program to raise awareness for the importance of bone marrow transplant testing. The Clemson community rallied around them, including founding a Be The Match chapter at Clemson University. That effort will change and potentially save many lives. But it would not be enough to save Lachlan, who relapsed in March. We were there for our second transplant, and we were told we couldn't, we couldn't proceed. So the most difficult thing was to, to bring Lachlan home, to live his days here with us and not in the hospital. We just kept hoping that something was going to change. We were waiting for a miracle, and we got it. You know, he's in heaven. I'm missing like crazy. Jason and I both do. We all do. But at the end of the day, it just, there was a bigger plan for him. Lachlan Tannery passed away May 7, 2015. He was two and a half years old. Two weeks after his death, the serendipitous snapshot was taken and gave life to a groundswell movement in Death Valley to remember this precious, roaring soul. What a phenomenal story and also a reminder of what this game can do in the community. I think that's the epitome of what the Clemson family is all about. It's been an amazing thing to watch because it gives us um, piece that, you know, Lachlan's still here, he's still making an impact. Since then, Lachlan the Tiger has been photographed at several positions across the Clemson campus. Each one is a special reminder of a courageous young boy. His spirit may not live within that tiger, but his spirit now lives within tigers everywhere.